Uh, I'm going to be talking about has war declined both in the long run since the early human societies through to the present day or the near present day and the short run, the period since 1945. And uh, I'll note first that classic sociological theory, uh, they all made the assumption that war was about to disappear. With the rise of industrial society or capitalist society uh, or markets or democratic society. So we we'll go through a list of people, which is what I've done there, who basically see a dualism in history between the prior societies, which engaged in considerable warfare, and warfare was the center of their social structure, um, to a contemporary and near future society in which wars would be disappearing. Uh, sometimes they didn't necessarily sort of believe that would happen, uh, and so when Kant talks about an era of perpetual peace, it, it's clear that that's his ideal, and it's not so clear that he thinks that that is uh, um, bound to happen. But if you take someone like Herbert Spencer, you have the uh, transition from a militant to an industrial society, and the others all have different versions of that. Now, the wars of 1898, which is, of course, significant for Americans, and 1914 did produce a rather more deviance. When Sumner uh, opposed the American war against Spain, uh, he recognized that he would lose the debate uh, because, he said, man is addicted to war. And so, along with German theorists who uh, also believed that war uh, would be a continuing feature of human society, German and Austrian theorists, and some of them actually approved of war. And of course, it's well known that for the first two years of World War I, Max Weber approved of the German war effort, and of course, uh, Scheler, Simmel, uh, Simmel, and others did likewise. After 1918, having just suffered a dreadful war, theorists didn't predict peace, but they preferred to ignore war and go on to nicer topics, except for fascists, of course. And then post-1945 sociology neglected war, and military sociology became about the organization of the military and not about wars. And the Marxist metaphor of the class struggle is only a metaphor. It doesn't involve uh, serious fighting. And of course then the Cold War was brought through proxies, and that's a kind of point I'm going to return to when talking about the short run. But in the 1990s there was the end of the Cold War and a revival of explicit liberal optimism. <laughs> And theorists like uh, 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 Muller, Azar Gatt, Steven Pinker, seen a long-term historical de decline from the very earliest human societies to the present day. And they also include declining homicide rates. And they, and especially Pinker, produce a lot of data. Now I'm going to be very brief about this. Uh, early human warfare, in this view, uh, hunter-gatherer war, uh, warfare was frequent and ferocious. But there is a, a big argument which is still enduring, and it's rather unclear uh, among archaeologists and anthropologists as to what, there isn't a, a kind of a compromise solution, uh, or even a, a win for either side about whether war was frequent in uh, hunter-gatherer societies. But most people, most scholars, uh, see the rise of the state as bringing more war. Uh, so it's in, apparently important to Pinker and the others that they show that there's a decline with the rise of the state because it's part of the long-run decline theory. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case, uh, but it's not a particularly important part of their theories. 
And when we come to ancient empires, uh, Pinker tends to believe, boasts, especially Assyrian boasts, of wiping out whole peoples. You know, I killed two million people, uh, says one, said one Khan. Uh, and, and another says, uh, I killed 800,000 people uh, in Baghdad. The total population of Baghdad has been estimated to be about 80,000 and not 800,000. Um, but this was part of a strategy, an Assyrian strategy, which many uh, pre-industrial um, warriors uh, uh, exemplified, which was a, a strategy of what I call exemplary repression. That is, you march into a country, you besiege uh, a city, you order it to surrender, it doesn't, therefore they fight, you eventually get into the city, and you wreak havoc there. What the Assyrians did was systematic. They would enslave the women and children, they would spare men who were artisans uh, and um, and farmers, I don't just mean peasants, but people who had genuine farms, and they would kill all the other men. And that is a signal to other cities that if they don't surrender, the same thing would happen to them. So they surrendered, they tended to surrender. Uh, so uh, the real casualties of these uh, early empires, the Mongols as well, um, is far less bloody, though bloody enough, uh, than uh, Pinker and others say. But they wanted to rule over people, not exterminate them. But when, when dealing with early societies, obviously the data are very uncertain and we can't be sure about anything. a lot in this table. These are, this is a kind of long run tendency, as it were. You can count the number of wars, but that's not very useful because World War, World War II becomes one war as do quite minor incidents. So the number of war fatalities of deaths has become uh, the, the standard measure. And this starts with a list of uh, the, the worst incidents in human history, the worst casualty rates uh, consequent upon war. Uh, they're listed down the left. The next column is the century in which they happened. Then the next one is absolute deaths. That just means the numbers killed. Okay? And in fact, the table is ordered uh, by that. So the World War II is the worst. Mao's, uh, the great famine consequent upon Mao's great loop forward is the second. The Mongols are the third. An 18th century Chinese rebellion and Lushan uh, is the fourth. Now I want to pause there. You'll note that for the Mongols, and these are the actual numbers of deaths in this, kind, in this uh, list. You will note that in the case of the Mongols and Andrew Shan, that there's a figure in bracket. And that's because the Pinker chooses uh, much too high an estimate. In fact, for the Mongols, you continuously see on the internet the notion of a range between 30 and 60 million dead, and he settles for somewhere in the middle of that. But if you try and trace these figures, you find no sources at all. It's one of those internet myths which kind of has a life of its own. Scholars have estimated that the casualty rate was 11.5 million. And similarly for Andrew Shan, uh, where the problem was that the, um, uh, that the Civil War destroyed most of the records of the imperial government. And so the population figure for the period immediately afterwards is deeply unreliable and scholars uh, uh, recognize or estimate that the figure is not 36 million but 13 million. Anyway, you go down that list. 
And it looks at first sight that there's not a lot to support Pinker and the others because World War II, Mao, uh, Stalin, uh, um, uh, World War I and the Russian Civil War all in the 20th century and the British Indian famines are in a mixture of the 19th and 20th centuries. So it would seem that the 20th century is the bloodiest of all. But Pinker actually says, and there's some merit in this, uh, that the vital thing is not absolute number of deaths, but relative numbers compared to the population. Well, the population he examines is the population of the world as a whole. So all of these estimates are of the relative deaths are the deaths per 100,000 population of the, of the world. And you can see from this that that changes a little bit. Uh, world War II is still at the top and Mao is the second. Um, sorry. <laughs> it changes considerably the earlier historical death rates and relative rates. So that and Lushan, even when you uh, adjust the figure, is the number one in terms of uh, death rates. Uh, the Mongols start out as two, but they are in reality somewhere around ten. Uh, and uh, uh, the Middle East slave trade from earlier centuries is number three. And you have uh, World War II shifting down uh, to nine because the world's population in the 20th century is enormously greater than that uh, in the 9th century or the uh, 14th century in the case of the Mongols, etc. And so he uh, uses this as evidence that there has actually been a decline in warfare. However, what I have added is the duration of the war. Because, for example, you're comparing World War II, which lasted for eight years from the Japanese invasion of China onwards, uh, with the slave trade, which uh, Pinker himself says lasted from the 7th to the 19th centuries. So I think there's a lot to be said for giving an annual death rate, an annual death rate, and that restores the former ordering, more or less. So World War II uh, returns to number one, and though the Chinese is still uh, number two, uh, the Taiping Rebellion in the 19th century is number three, uh, well, Tamerlan is, is not modern at all, uh, but Mao is number five, uh, I'm sorry, World War I is number two, right? Uh, because Andrew Shen should really not be number two, but number eight. So if you look at duration as well, it restores the argument that the 20th, from the late 19th century through the first half of the 20th century, this is the most bloody century there's probably ever been, which really in long run terms, if you accept my argument, uh, it, uh, it falsifies the argument of these optimistic liberals in the long run. Now, I've mentioned most of these uh, uh, problems uh, already. One might add as well that the 20th century killings are separated by Pinker into uh, six different cases. World War II, World War I, the Russian and Chinese civil wars, Stalin's killings, and Mao famines. Now, if you think about that list, they're all within a 50-year period, and there are connections between them all. Are they completely separate events? No. If you're counting the slave trade lasting for 12 centuries, uh, it's clear that there are closer relations between uh, these 20th century events uh, than earlier uh, centuries of long duration. So it makes the first half of the 20th century 
easily, by far and away, the bloodiest known half century of human history. Which <laughs> is not surprising, but it's something that uh, Pinker and the others have tried to deny. But the overall conclusion from this has to be that there's been variability through time and through regions, uh, not an overall decline, and that the first half of the 20th century is the worst of all. Now, they also examine homicide and note a long-term decline in homicide rates in Europe, Japan, and the US. And we no longer have dueling. We no longer have public ex executions. And we thought we didn't have any torture. We have a little bit, but not compared to uh, earlier centuries. So the advanced societies today are largely pacified. It is within the, the country, there is not person against person lethal violence of any great regularity. A number of people have argued this. Pinker draws heavily on Elias, Norbert Elias. But actually, if, if he'd known more about Elias, he would know that the civilization, civilizing process that Elias detects uh, from the medieval to the 20th century uh, um, is as far as Elias goes. And considering that he was a, a refugee from Nazi Germany and was used by the British as an interpreter uh, to interview uh, uh, Nazi war criminals, uh, he saw it first hand that he had to modify his view and saw that there was a decivilizing process going on in the 20th century. And so Elias can't really be used to support, to support uh, Pinker. But of course, Foucault, Giddens, myself have all agreed that the growth of infrastructural power, which is, is my term, is something that has largely pacified uh, uh, the internal structure of modern societies. So, in fact, Pinker et al. are correct about homicide for most of the world. Now, not entirely. There's, a, there's various studies of England in the 14th century uh, which give a, a variety of uh, violent death rates. Uh, you can see they average around 24. And uh, the city of Oxford is one of those, and it's more or less average. And the uh, interesting thing for an academic about this uh, is that the killings in Oxford are about, half of them are by students or professors, students or teachers, okay? <laughs> so that, that's an interesting uh, sidelight on the extent to which there is uh, internal violence. Now I should point out, however, I don't know how many of you know uh, the BBC uh, murder mysteries which are shown on PBS. Uh, Inspector Morse, Inspector Lewis, and the third one is Endeavour, which is the young Morse. Well, I've calculated that death rate, <laughs> and it's about the same as the 13th century rate. So we still fantasize a lot about murder, uh, but we don't do it. And we academics, we bicker, but we don't matter anymore. However, there are um, more violent cities in the world today, much more violent. There are 50 cities in the world today, according to data, that uh, have many more killings than these historic figures. Uh, most of them are in Latin America, two are in South Africa, but four are in the US, and Detroit and New Orleans are in the top 10. Now Pinker sees this and it worries him, but he concludes that there's a, a lagged civilizing process happening, uh, which uh, hasn't reached 
South America yet, and also hasn't reached the American South and the American Afro-American community. <laughs> this is dangerous stuff that he's uttering here. So if you take out the South and African Americans, uh, you get a much lower rate. Now, of course, if you took out certain groups from any of the other uh, cities, uh, you'd also get lower rates. And I don't think that is um, legitimate. But they do think that eventually all societies will be classified. I move now to the short, to the period since 1945. And there has been, as everyone knows, a big decline in the number of interstate wars. A steady decline right, through the decades since the, since the World War II. And war is no longer the backbone of very many states, especially advanced states. There are various causes of this. There's war weariness. Since Europeans uh, contributed about 80% of wars in the uh, centuries before uh, 1945, the fact that they're no longer making war on each other uh, brings down the global rate enormously. Uh, there's also the end of empires, which Andreas Wimmer has written about, of course, except for the one surviving empire, the United States. And there's the nuclear confrontation, mutually assured destruction, which has so far worked and prevented direct wars uh, between nuclear powers. Uh, if there are skirmishes between them, as in the case of India and Pakistan, they're careful not to escalate towards that level. And there's also uh, a certain degree of international regulation of the nation-state system. For example, Africa with the, uh, the African Union. And fifthly, a very high level of international and transnational interdependence. But to balance the decline of interstate wars, there has of course been a big rise in civil wars about 50% of which are ethnic. From the 1930s to the 1990s, and then a slight decline, and then growth from 2010. And 2015 is the worst year uh, that we know of uh, for killings, especially of civilians, which I'll come on to, and the highest number of refugees from war zones. So one couldn't say from this that there was a, a global decline in warfare, only the decline of a particular kind of warfare interstate. Now this is civil wars. But the curious thing about contemporary civil wars is they're not merely internal affairs. They've been internationalized. Most recent civil wars have involved outside intervention as well. And here's a list of them, I'm not going to go through it all, but if you think about the Eastern Congo, interventions by nine African countries in that, those struggles, uh, Mali, France, and, and, and uh, Chad, plus US logistical support, we go down to Syria, we now have to add Russia to my list there, Yemen, there's even more countries, and many of these, some of these involve NATO, which means it's not, as far as the West is concerned, Western intervention in these civil wars. It's not just the United States. It's Britain, it's France, it's most of the NATO members supplying a, a few planes each, or naval ships, or whatever. And armed intervention is also common against stateless religious groups, uh, Al-Qaeda, IS or Daesh, Boko Haram in Nigeria, the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda. And, and these are transnational 
operating right through borders. So civil wars in the rest of the world, not in our world, in the rest of the world, are not something completely independent of us. We are involved in them. But we're involved in them in a distinctive way. And here I want to use the, dis the distinction that Randall Collins has made between ferocious killing and callous killing. Ferocious killing is hacking at bodies, which is war throughout most of history. Trying to dismember, kill the person standing directly in front of you. And this needs a ferocious mentality. And ferocity was a highly prized social virtue. Okay? The best warriors, the craziest warriors, got high status. Now today, we don't hack at bodies. We don't knife, we don't even shoot each other at short range. And we don't hack at enemy, enemy bodies. Uh, a certain amount of this goes on in the civil wars by the locals, but we don't do that. Torture, uh, rape, and the like, and the activities of Daesh, or ICE, or ISIS, they do horrify us. But long-range killing doesn't apparently hor horrify us. And I want to um, quote one of the most callous examples of killing. It's from the commander of the Enola Gay, who has just dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And he writes in the log, results clear cut, successful in all respects, visible effects greater than any test, conditions normal in airplane following <coughs> delivery. Now, who would know that that involved the killing of hundreds of thousands of people? It sounds like any kind of office mem memo or something. So callous warfare is where we kill, but we do so without uh, anything other than uh, a need to look away, a need to look away from it. Uh, and this is what the... Uh, commander of the Enola Gay was doing. Uh, um, and of course this has developed very considerably. We have a vast number of drones that are now engaged in warfare. And uh, of course many of the American ones, uh, the NATO allies have them too, but many of the American ones, are organized from Kansas. And they kill people in the Middle East. But the, 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 this is an extreme version of how far away the killer is from the killed. So it's undoubtedly the case that we kill more than Daesh does, or than Al-Qaeda do through our aerial bombing at a distance. But we don't have an overtly violent culture. Homicide has gone down, and we don't need ourselves to be involved in the killing that the US and NATO are engaging. At the most, it's what I called in the context of the British uh, Argentinian uh, uh, war, spectator sport militarism, where we stand on the sidelines and we cheer them on. I remember vividly the, all the reporting of this war on the British side, and we cheer them on, but we make no sacrifices whatever ourselves. If we're not involved, it's a, a few professional soldiers and sailors and airmen who are involved. Uh, so, um, 
that, that's a case of support for this kind of warfare, but without any claim uh, to be, or any signs of being ferocious. But the other cases are where um, people may have almost no knowledge of this. I mean, in the case of the Yemen, do people know that we're supporting the Sunni against the Shia, that we got involved in a sectarian Islamic war? I don't think, I don't think, hardly any Americans would know that. So they're not cheering them on from sometimes. Uh, this is being done behind our backs, as it were. So this explains why modern culture is pacific. It's specific for two reasons. One, the decline of violence within, and two, uh, with some exceptions, like Detroit and New Orleans. And secondly, why liberals think the war has declined. Since we're not directly involved in war ourselves, we have small mercenary armies, and actually, Weapons have, de have been devised which make them almost invulnerable. So our losses since Vietnam have been very low and are now much lower than they were in the Iraq wars. So there's a kind of a sense in which there isn't war. But there is war and we're involved in it. Now, a characteristic of contemporary wars is a continuation of the trend of World War I and World War II, which is the increasing civilian death rate. Okay, in World War II, civilian deaths outnumbered military deaths, but not by an enormous amount, except in the case of China, where the uh, opening of the dam systems by one or the other side in China or Japan would result in the, uh, in the deaths of a million people. Um, but here we have some cases from Africa in which you can see that the battle deaths, the column of battle deaths, it is not particularly large, not by historical standards, the, la the largest one is uh, Angola, 160,000. But in all of the cases, the civilian deaths greatly outweigh the military deaths. And indeed, the highest estimate, which is the top of the range for Mozambique, is that just under a third of deaths would be military. Um, but in most cases, they're much lower. And in the case of the Congo, uh, they are only 6%. So these are mass killings. And indeed, the Eastern Congo uh, um, should make it into Pinker's list. His list is actually of the top 21. And since there isn't room for 21 rows, uh, on a, uh, on a PowerPoint, uh, I put it down to the 14 top ones. Uh, but the Congo should be there in, in his list, and isn't. So, this is a, well, the number of conflicts doesn't show very much. This is world military expenditure uh, from 1988 to 2014. And you can see there was an initial decline uh, in the 19, early 1990s. But from there on, uh, military expenditure across the globe increased. And indeed, the figure for 2015, which is here, uh, is almost certainly the, the highest of all. In fact, it, it is the highest of all. The number of refugees is the highest of all. Uh, so, uh, in the very short run, uh, 
and I think we all know this, there's been a big increase in war in the last few years. From one region, the Middle East contributing most of it. So, in conclusion, in a shift from ferocious to casual callous violence in most developed countries, there's an indirect experience of war. I didn't mention the arms sales, which are very large. The United States is the leading arms seller, but very significant also. Uh, Russia, China, France, and Britain. <coughs> the fighting is largely done through proxies. <coughs> Most of our interventions are quite small in terms of the commitment of military resources, even though they may result in large-scale killing. <coughs> And there is at most spectator sport militarism, in which we make no sacrifices at all. And this reinforces the decline in homicide to produce a pacified culture and an illusion of no wars. They are barely visible wars. less so in the U.S. because the U.S. involvement is uh, so persistent and does on occasion ratchet upwards. Um, but of course Britain and France ratcheted upwards also in Libya. And this is why many people believe the war is declining. There's no long-term historic decline in interstate wars, as I showed earlier on, there is a shorter term decline since 1945, especially in Europe, and then after a decade's delay of there being wars, East Asia. This has been replaced by civil wars elsewhere, but they are usually internationalized. So there's a decline in the number of major conflicts but no decline in smaller or civil wars. <coughs> in fact, civil wars are still increasing. And civilian deaths are outweighing battle deaths uh, on an increasing scale. <coughs> now, what of the future? Well, the Middle East is likely to remain violent there are increasing signs of a kind of inability by the United States and China to accept, or from the part of the United States, to accept the rise of China, or of China <coughs> to abandon the notion that being a great power involves military expansion. So there is Chinese military expansion going on in the islands of the Pacific. Uh, and there is a, a, a American denunciation of this and the building up of American forces in the Pacific, switching them from Europe to the Pacific. So that's a very worrying sign of the future. It doesn't necessarily mean that China and the United States would go to war directly with each other, I mean, unless human folly, which does sometimes enter human affairs, becomes, you know, grotesque. <coughs> but the second cause for worry is, of course, the rise of Russia and its desire to predominate in Slavic-speaking countries and American reluctance to accept that. We have continuous propaganda in the, in the West that the Western Ukraine is the virtuous party, the Eastern Ukraine and the Russians uh, are the villains. But of course, Ukraine should be two countries. If they can't get along, which they can't get along, majority Ukrainian and the majority Russian-speaking uh, parts should be separated. They are the Crimea, if it wants to, should be 
part of Russia, it certainly welcomed Russian intervention, whether they think the same thing now is another matter. But we are girding up for confrontation with Russia again. After all, Russian expansion, recent Russian expansion, can be seen as a response to the expansion of NATO to the boundaries of Russia itself and the stationing of uh, the anti-ballistic missiles uh, bases across Eastern Europe pointing at Russia, supposedly there to deal with Iran, but actually pointing at Russia. So it's not surprising that the Russians expand a bit in response to American and NATO expansion. Now, in neither, in, nor in this case, is it all that likely that there would be a war between the United States and Russia. But you could have a return in both continents, well, in, in, in uh, Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe and the Middle East, as far as uh, Russia or America is concerned, and in the Pacific, as far as China is, uh, and America are concerned, we could have a revival of proxy warfare, which was the predominant form of warfare in the Cold War period. That is, the United States and the Soviet Union tried very hard not to have their own troops involved in clashes with each other, but they used proxies to uh, try and influence the regimes of the world. So it seems to me that we are in danger of being uh, uh, returning back to the Cold War period uh, and in fact to the period before the pacification of East Asia when the United States and uh, Russia and sometimes China fought proxy wars uh, against each other in Korea and Vietnam especially. So, uh, those possibilities remain, a distant possibility but devastating in its effects would be nuclear war. It's possible to conceive of there being environmental wars. If there are major steps taken uh, to mitigate uh, um, uh, environmental uh, disaster, um, that when we got close to that disaster, uh, states could go to war with each other. That is, the more privileged states of the, of the world in the north of the world uh, uh, and could erect fortress walls, you know, build a wall across uh, the Mexican border, build a wall across the Canadian border. Canadians would do that. <laughs> and uh, all kinds of bad consequences and deaths might result. So, who knows, uh, human beings do have the capacity for kind of rational solution of military threats and of conciliation, uh, but they also from time to time uh, lose control and uh, uh, let loose uh, the dogs of war and are still doing so. So that the optimistic liberals, of whom Pink is the leading one, are mostly wrong. Kant's perpetual peace is not much nearer, but Kant also said that maybe it was necessary to have wars every now and then to show people how terrible they are. And maybe that's more of the future than perpetual peace. History versus historiography. Um, what caused the onset of World War I? We are told it was one gunshot in Sarajevo. Surely, sounds nonsense. What do you think is the real cause? Well, uh, <laughs> The gunshot in um, in uh, Sarajevo uh, 
uh, was the trigger, but it was the trigger to specific kinds of mobilizations. To the Austrians uh, determined to punish the Serbs, the Russians to come in on the side of the Serbs, and Germany to back Austria, Hungary, and attack um, Russia and also uh, Belgium and France, Belgium and France. Now this presupposes a geopolitical system uh, near, nearing crisis uh, in which rival alliances have been built up and, um, uh, and, and make Europe rather threatening. On the other hand, there are other contingencies as well. So, uh, what's one interesting feature is that um, the, the German mobilization plans included mobilization over the border in Belgium. The seizing of Belgian railheads and the uh, state and the immediate stationing of German troops there. Now that was as far as France and Britain was concerned, that was a casus belli, that, that made uh, the Western Front inevitable. Uh, but this mobilization plan was not known to the Chancellor of Germany or the Kaiser. It was something that had been hatched by the military itself. So there we have a case of the autonomy of the military in Germany uh, having an impact on the future of the world. And there are other things as well. I think I mentioned the, the problem the British had, that they were not a the liberal government wasn't able to deter Germany by saying, if you invade Belgium, you're at war with us, because pacifists would leave the cabinet and, uh, and the liberal government would fall, and there would be conservatives, and of course, politicians above all value their own survival. Uh, and there are others too. So uh, you have a mixture of long-term long -term structural causes and short-term contingencies. World War I was not inevitable, even given the geopolitical configuration I mentioned. Uh, but you need things like Austria-Hungary thinking their end was coming soon, uh, and the monarchy, you know, the Habsburgs would end soon unless it was able to show the world that it was still a major power and so they went in a very foolhardy way against uh, first Serbia and then Russia. Um, so the causes of World War I, like most causes of war, are extremely complex and they change as you go through the escalation period towards war. Now, what's, one thing that's interesting is that German territorial demands, you know, Alsace or Rome, is like that, only emerged after the beginning of the war. They weren't there beforehand or in the initial German war aims. Uh, but there was a sense that, well, if you're going to make war, you have to have some justification for it. And so the fact that the German population uh, of Alsace, anyway, sorry, the population of Alsace is was majority German speaking at that point. And uh, so uh, um, uh, sorry, I've got that wrong. It's other regions that they go into because uh, they already have Alsace from the Franco Prussian mm -hmm. last time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not sure if I entirely understand your uh, politicizing characterization of, uh, of of those who see a decline in war as being you, you, you described them a couple of times as as liberals or optimistic liberals and what uh, point does that serve to politicize um, those who see a decline as opposed to those who are uh, considering war to be inevitable. Okay, I, I take the point, for, but I, um, 
I'm forgetting the, the, the word liberal in the United States means <laughs> something different. It's, it's the liberal tradition of, uh, of Western, especially European uh, thought uh, from uh, you know, people like Herbert Spencer, Saint-Simon, etc. They were left of center without being socialists. And then Pinker is clearly um, a liberal and he's optimistic. Actually, uh, you're right in one sense. It's not true of Azar Gant, who's an <laughs> Israeli colonel. Um, I shouldn't think he's liberal from the way that he writes. Um, but um, I think liberalism is optimistic in general. And that's their optimism is the defining feature, and I call them liberal because, except for Gap, they're in a tradition of liberalism. Well, that just takes into account the Western tradition, though, and war is a universal. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what purpose it serves. Well, I was only talking about Western theorists here. I was talking about uh, you know, why, two, two why, Americans why, why and one Israeli. Why concentrate just on the West? <clears throat> well, obviously in the wars, I'm not concentrating on the West, right? right. Uh, but what our culture receives is essentially Western thinking. It is actually paradoxical that of these three people who have recently revived it, Two are Americans and one is an Israeli, and these are the countries still making war. Uh, Eric. Are there any clear implications of your just your general analysis of both that you've reviewed in both days uh, about what peace activists should be trying to do? That is, if if war, if, if the tendency towards war is somehow a transhistorical, one of the transhistorical forces that in play in a world of power structures and geopolitics, if that tendency is not just withering away through some natural process, and people are mobilizing strategically to try to do something about it, what's the recommendation? Well, one of my shortcomings is a lack of uh, a kind of normative <laughs> perspective. Uh, and unlike you, I don't in, in generally draw uh, conclusions about how people should behave. Uh, in this respect, I don't think that anything I would say would, uh, uh, would differ significantly from what uh, activist uh, intellectuals are saying against war. Well, I, don't mean uh, I think it's important to recognize, uh, and for Americans and, and British and French, etc., to recognize how much killing they're doing. Well, I didn't mean a normative condemnation of war. I meant the strategies of what yes. you should do about it, which isn't itself, doesn't require you to personally condemn war, although I assume you do, but just what are the recommendations for what needs to be done to reduce the probabilities and frequencies of war? Yes, well, that's what I've just begun to, to talk about, to uh, reveal to people the extent to which uh, we are already at war, or war is being conducted without our close knowledge. Uh, it's also uh, um, would involve an, an appeal to the United States and China uh, to uh, and especially the United States, since that, that's the one that we can potentially influence, uh, to recognize the rise of China and come to terms with it, and not assume that every little Chinese move forward needs to be countered by a fleet. And the same thing for Russia, to recognize why Russia is doing these things I accept Syria for this. I mean, I'm not, in, in, I'm not understanding of Putin in that respect, but I am in terms of Crimea and the Ukraine. And so much of our news is propaganda, uh, 
So, I... Uh, Pinker has an appealing um, uh, metaphor here about the angels and demons of our soul. And he thinks that the angels are triumphing. And uh, I think that there's always struggle between angels and demons within us as far as war is concerned. Uh, but um, I think that all that I've just said would be perfectly recognizable to, to uh, peace activists. And peace, peace research is a major part of it. political science and, and to some extent sociology. If I could just follow up with one. So on the American political spectrum, Rand Paul advocates a complete end to American proactive interventionism. So one peace activist tradition says if we could snap our fingers and just have the United States never intervene unless we are ourselves attacked and just let everybody else sort out their own things, that would actually reduce militarism globally. So that even though there might be some specific situations in which it might have been better to have intervened, it's still better to have a rule of no intervention because the dynamics that that would set in motion would be increased pacifying. Now, it's not clear from your analysis whether you think that would be a good thing or a bad thing. So, in, in the sources of social power, before I discuss this, and I say, you know, on balance, it would, the world would be better if America did not intervene. Though, as you just indicated, uh, in the case of genocide, uh, you know, it, it may be, and of course, Rwanda was the one case in which the U.S. and France uh, dissuaded the United Nations from increasing the U.N. presence to a force that could have potentially stopped the genocide. So uh, it doesn't give you much confidence because American interests were not really involved in Rwanda. It was an insignificant country, um, didn't have oil. But I think, by and large, yes, uh, non-intervention would be better. Uh, whether that would mean that China would march through Asia, <laughs> I don't know. I'd, but I doubt it, because uh, the, as, I, as I pointed out in, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, the most wars are considered to be defensive and never against um, other powers who are threatening you and you take counter steps. And, uh, that continues. Yeah. Do you think arms sales drive the recent war increase? I mean, when you look at the mm -hmm. cost of arms sales, and it's, you know, we say, oh, well, they buy more arms because they have more civil war. But the question is, mm -hmm. you know, besides Ron Paul saying we should stop intervening, maybe we should stop selling arms. And that might be the big answer to the whole. Yeah, I agree with that, but that is. is yeah, hard to do. Yeah, very hard to do. We're very profitable industry. And uh, both in the U.S. and in the other countries, I know. I mean, if you think the Ukraine <laughs> produces and exports weapons, um, maybe about their only viable industry. Uh, so, you know, arms sales are important. Um, arms sales. Um, They increase the killing capacity of regimes and of a few rebel movements that the US or Russia supports. But uh, mostly, um, uh, well, the rebel movements mostly have low grade women, which they get on the kind of, you know, not from governments, but from a kind of transnational market process and the surplus uh, Soviet weapons are uh, very important today. I was once at a conference where we were sitting around a big table in alphabetical order and the person next to me, it should have been Nelson Mandela, but he was a no-show, the guy next to me 
was the Archbishop of Central Africa, um, a man called Makulo, and I gave, I gave a, a, a talk on the spread of ethnic conflict around the world, and he turned to me afterwards and said, there's only one thing responsible, the Kalashnikov. Well, oh, that's an exaggeration, <laughs> but Kalashnikovs sell for about $15 across the world, and so they're available to any the trouble movement. Uh, following up on that, and on to the uh, home national scene, with less gun sale, wouldn't there be less homicide here in the world? <laughs> yeah, let's get started there. Yeah, mind you, the existing weaponry is so formidable that the murder rate could continue for quite a very long time. Of course, it's not the gun owning ratio itself. Switzerland has a higher proportion of guns because of this tradition. I mean, they're not real anymore. They have more common sense, though. Well, most of them don't know how to use it. They have, they have to keep one in their closet as part of the People's Defense Force for historic reasons, but they don't use them. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with all of the literature that you've been citing, and I, but I gather that it's primarily geopolitical in orientation, and I'm just wondering if there have been studies on the root causes of war that dwell more on on the economics of war and also on the biology of war? Uh, the biology of war means what? Well, I, I, I'm one of those maybe liberal thinkers that, that um, see a lot of the root causes of war as, as being biological. Actually, that it's testosterone driven and it, it's tribal, and um, that that these are some of the driving forces that, that uh, impel people to this to this universality of war. Well, I don't agree with that. Um, yesterday, I talked about uh, economic causes of war as well, and they are among the more important causes, but they. They don't usually operate on their own without the influence of other, uh, of other aspects of social structure. I'm sorry about this. Um, uh, the problem of the biological argument we just advanced is that there are parts of the world that are almost totally Pacific. There hasn't been any conflict in, in uh, Nordic. Uh, Nordic uh, countries, uh, no, in Scandinavia, because I have to accept Finland here, for two centuries. And uh, there was not uh, war in Tokugawa, Japan, or in uh, uh, very little in, uh, in China, Qing China. So there are enormous variations between different social groupings. So why does, do some groups have more testosterone than others? Is it a question of diet induced? Or? I'm very skeptical about that. Human beings clearly have the potentiality for aggression. But like most psychological traits, you can always name the other, the opposite, and say they also have a, uh, a disposition towards avoiding conflict. Randall Collins is someone who's written at great length about how human beings are not very good at war, and based principally on small incidents in which he, he notes, uh, he witnesses a number of fights small gang fights and things, and he says human beings are incompetent at fighting, and they, they, they you know, don't do it very well, and they're very reluctant to do it, and there's what he calls a tunnel of violence, where the personal group has to start down that tunnel, and it's a kind of escalating process, 
and they, they emerge after the tunnel uh, killing them. Uh, so he's someone who believes that on balance human beings are more pacific than they are aggressive and it needs special circumstances for them to become aggressive. Well, yeah. I just wanted to pick up on um, biological uh, reason for war. Uh, do you have any thoughts on gender um, or the gendered aspects of war? And and especially, I was thinking of um, research that I've read that tied an increase in violence to uh, populations that had a surplus of, of males. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, including in many of the areas that you mentioned. Um, in which we will possibly see an increase in violence or continuation of violence. Um, and also a tie uh, with uh, tying violence um, intrastate and interstate with the way that a, a nation treats women. Um, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, I think that the, uh, the data are, are about young men where you have a disproportion of young men in your war languages against wars, and this has been especially advanced for Arab countries. Uh, there's a big debate about it, and I'm, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, war has been traditionally male. People will search for Amazons, but find it difficult to find them. Uh, but then the public sphere has been male, not just military power, but political power too, and the higher reaches of economic power. So it's, um, is it a bio, um, your question perhaps, or it might be biological, uh, or it might be social and cultural. Now that women are getting more equal, and now that women are admitted to some armed forces, and now that you have some politicians like um, uh, Margaret Thatcher in Indira Gandhi, not noticeable, not noticeably Pacific politicians, <laughs> mm -hmm. are you going to get an end of this, of this, bi of this gender bias? Uh, I don't know. The American argument, the American government during World War II, their argument in not uh, helping out the Jews in the Europe, for example, during the Warsaw Ghetto Rebellion and etc., is they had, they had to put all their effort and energy into the war effort. By winning the war effort, then they could uh, save the Jews in World War II, and that was the argument that the American government presented. By the time that World War II ended, there were practically no Jews left, uh, really, to speak of. And the same could be said about the Armenians in World War I. By the time World War I ended, the Armenians in the, in the Ottoman Empire, they are practically eliminated also. So the justification for wars in these, in these two World War Wars, supposedly it was to help these situations, but in reality, did not accomplish that. So the argument for war seems to be sort of fake. Well, <laughs> you're assuming that um, the American motivation might have been to help the Jews. Of course it wasn't. So uh, it, uh, America entered the war, and thank God America did enter the war, uh, because of its uh, fear of uh, Nazi Germany becoming a threatening presence in the whole world and its traditional links uh, with Britain and it swallowed its distaste of communism to make the Soviet Union an ally. It was for geopolitical reasons essentially and perhaps also, I mean, no, in these cases there are always um, leadership groups who believe in democracy against uh, autocracy. I mean, some of the Neocons in the Iraq war genuinely believed that they were taking democracy to the Middle East. So, 
uh, you know, I mean, they, it's world historical bad luck for the Jews and the Armenians, but nobody was going to intervene for the purpose of helping them. In fact, when Germany, before the war, uh, uh, tried to ne negotiate with the British, uh, to, for the British to allow uh, major shipments of Jews to Madagascar. The British refused. Uh, they didn't want German ships sailing uh, through territory, through uh, sea areas that they controlled. So, uh, <laughs> indirectly, the, uh, the British could have saved a large number of Jews, but they weren't interested because other motivations were more important. Back to the gender issue. Well, indeed, things have changed. In America, we have, I think, generals or high positions, they're ladies. In uh, Europe, there is one lady, minister of defense, um, uh, sort of a medical doctor lady, but she's Minister of Defense. So that has really changed very much in that sort of thing. And what the heck? In, in, there are very few armies. The, I think the Israeli army is one of them where women, women, are, women yes. fight alongside men. Mm -hmm. than normally in support positions. Um, in World War uh, Two, in, in Britain, there were um, gun crews situated all around the southeast of England. The goal was to shoot down German planes. And the majority of the, of the gun crews were female. But only only a man could actually fire. And there are occasions where there wasn't a man and they didn't fire. Well, but we know that women fought before, like in the Middle Ages. Like it was actually like the Vikings, like all of like there was tons of women fighting. It was only outlawed later. So this idea that women never fought or never were part of wars is is a fiction, and it's a way of a modern way of reading gender into it. And also, once again, assuming that testosterone causes aggression, which has been shown that it doesn't over and over and over. So if you if you assume that from the start, you're reading really modern gendered understandings into history that don't exist and did not exist back then. And also contradict historical evidence. Well, I, I can't comment on that, but I can add uh, that there are um, a, a number of female suicide bombs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also the case that it's especially true in, say, the Central American Revolutionary yeah. Wars women fought in great numbers. Yeah, and in Sri Lanka as well. Other comments? The book is speaking. Okay, so um, come back tomorrow.